Welcome everyone and I'm very glad that you could join us today. My name is Laura Jones and I'm the Northwest Regional Coordinator of the Indiana State Library's Professional Development Office. I will be your host and question moderator for today's webinar, The Ins and Outs of Virtual Programming, presented by Amy Dalton, Heidi Lovett, and Kate Blakely. After this webinar has been transcribed, it will be available on the Indiana State Library's archived webinars page. If you're watching an archived recording of this presentation, information on how to obtain your LEU is in the video's description in YouTube. For weekly updates on upcoming trainings and to learn more about what's happening in libraries across the state, please subscribe to the Indiana State Library's e-newsletter, The Wednesday Word, and check our continuing education website for other professional development opportunities. So let's get started with an introduction of our speakers today. Amy Dalton started in libraries as a high school shelver. She's worked in the audio-visual department for Monroe County Public Library, was an adult and teen librarian, and then the non-print selector for Indianapolis Public Library, and is now an adult and teen librarian and the head of the STEAM committee for Johnson County Public Library. She also works on JCPL's social media and hosts their podcast, Backstories. Her background in television and film came in handy during virtual programming. Heidi Lovett studied English literature at Manchester University and has worked at the North Manchester Public Library for almost nine years. She's been in charge of teen programming for eight years, adult programming for seven years, and children's programming for four years. Heidi has a passion for her community and loves building strong relationships with anyone that is willing. Kate Blakely has worked with children and teens in various capacities for 22 years. Most recently, she spent five years with the Porter County Public Library System before taking the Children's Librarian position at Bremen Public Library in 2019. Next up is Heidi Lovett. Heidi, are you ready? I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. All right. Um, well, thank you for having me, for one. And um, I'm really excited to be on a panel with uh, such awesome women. So, um, yeah, we're going to have fun and talk about some cool things that we've done virtually here at NMPL, North Manchester Public Library. Um, I do want to preface all of this with just saying, because I know it's been a year for everybody, <laughs> um, I want to just preface it by saying you are enough and you are doing enough. Um, also, everyone needs to practice self-care and be kind to yourself. Um, there is so much content right now that it can feel overwhelming and you can feel like, oh my gosh, am I doing enough? I think it's important to know that you are. Um, just being here and learning and educating yourself is, it, you're doing that. You're doing something. So, um, and I'm sure your patrons are all very, very excited for what you've been providing for them. Um, and then also I wanted to just say different programs work for different communities. So um, while listening to Amy's presentation, that really hit home for me because because there are things that worked for her community that definitely did not work for our community. Um, so just because something works that I talk about, something works really well for us, doesn't mean it's going to work really well for um, yours. So anyway, I just wanted to preface all of that. Um, with this. All right. Oh, my goodness. That's my face. OK, so um, I. With my slides, I just uh, listed all of our programs that we did. I, I did a children's program. I did a teen slide and an adult slide. Um, but I'm going to talk about you know, what worked and what didn't for us. I also want everyone to know that if they have a little star next to them, that means it was done by our children's librarian, Sarah Morbitzer. Um, I definitely don't want to take credit for programs that I didn't do. Um, a lot of a lot of our virtual success was a um, was a group effort from you know even our um, our what am I thinking of our um, adult our adult desk manager she does a lot of our um, social media and a lot of our marketing 
Um, so she has done a lot of really cool stuff through Instagram and Facebook as well. Um, so anyway, I um, about children's programming. Um, the the first thing we started um, was when we you know went into lockdown with story time. Um, that's something we could do from home, and we were only doing Facebook Live to begin. Um, it was it was pretty much anything myself or Sarah had in our homes that we could just put together and put um, on our library page. A lot of our kids were missing story time, and it was so we learned for children's programming. It was so important for the kids to still see our faces. Um, I know a lot of, I've seen a few libraries or librarians I've talked to have said, well, why should I do my own story time when there's so many other story times I could just share? I mean, why reinvent the wheel? But we learned that it is so important for those kids to see their librarian in these videos. Even if you feel like, you know, you're doing the same thing thousands of other libraries are doing. Um, so anyway, we thought that that was really important. We've also had a lot of luck with um, our activity kits and take-home stuff, so they can still use um, supplies that they would usually use in an in-person story time. They could still use it in, at home. So um, mostly our watercolor trays and our dot markers are usually big hits in in in-person story time. So what we did, we just bagged up everything and made them so they could check them out and take them home um, and kind of follow along with us and still try to have somewhat semblance of a normal story time, um, even if they had to be at home. Let's see. Um, a lot of our, and kind of along those lines, um, we did draw, paint, and learn. Um, I've done famous landmarks and you know famous places um, all around the world, and for those, um, we've really learned that kids are better at listening to a presentation, or they are ta they take in information better when they are doing something with their hands. Um, so I've really tried to keep that in in my mind as I've um, been planning these kits. So the draw, paint, learn, I talk about facts while we're drawing and painting. Um, same with our homeschool kids. I encourage them to pick up a kit, and those kids usually, along with facts about the artist, um, that we're, it's, an, it's an art class for homeschoolers, um, along with the artists, we also have um, coloring pages that relate to that art artist or the art they do, and um, they, I, I encourage them to color while I'm giving my presentation about, the, about whatever artist we're talking about that month. Um, all right, so let's see. I have a list here next to me. Um, so, yeah, and we also noticed for children's programming, it was really important to also add in some... Um, some activities or you know virtual programs that they could do as a family. Um, our watercolor tutorials, we've gotten a lot of feedback from families saying that um, you know they they love doing it together. We've seen pictures of entire families, moms, dads, kids, everybody at the table, and they're all painting together. Um, so that that was nice too to see that we're really you know. We're encouraging family time. Oh, and one more thing, virtually, uh, as far as children's programming goes, um, we were, I've, I've just started, I've, I've got about three or four classes now, but most of our um, children, most of our children's programs, sorry, um, so, most of our children's classrooms, so like elementary school, um, intermediate school, even our Head Start classrooms, they have smart boards, they have laptops, and it, since we can't go in the classroom anymore, we can't, um, we can't, you know, read stories, we can't sing songs like we would for, I think we used to do just preschoolers um, in kindergarten, but now it's kind of given us greater access 
So um, the teacher will just pull us up on their smart board. I'll zoom in, and um, I'll be able to do a story time with the younger grades. And then um, I will be starting a second grade book talk next month. Um, so any teacher that contacts me, I just set up, you know, one day a month, one morning, one half hour a month, where I can zoom into their classroom and talk to the kids. And that just really shows, um, that really gives them recognition still. They're still seeing their librarians. They still know who we are. And uh, it reminds them that the library is still here, and we still offer a lot of things. It just may not look like it used to. I am going to move to adults in all ages. Oh, I think I left my, I thought it was children, teen, adult. I think I left my teen one for last. Um, so for adult and all ages programming, um, I really took advantage of painting tutorials. And um, I'm a certified Ross instructor, so I can teach Bob Ross classes. Um, and the Bob Ross company just approved doing that virtually because of the pandemic. So that was nice. Um, so anyway, I was able to teach a few of those. The problem with those was that not a lot of people have oil painting art supplies at home. Um, so I haven't done that in a little bit. I did a couple. It was more of a demonstration than a tutorial because I knew without those supplies, it's hard to follow along. But people did like watching. Um, and I would do even like time lapse videos of me painting a landscape. Um, so that was really cool. But it wasn't something people could actually really do with me. Um, Cook a Book is one of our most popular virtual programs. And our children's librarian, Sarah, does that one with her son, um, the very famous David. And he's up there in his, oh my gosh, in his little red sweatshirt. Uh, he's so cute. So um, anyway, a lot of people. That was another thing. A lot of people loved seeing us at home live. Anything could happen. Um, I have a son. She has a son. Um, and they very often would interrupt. Things would go awry. They would say things that would embarrass us. But we actually found that those that actually bumped our numbers. <laughs> it didn't necessarily help our sanity, but it bumped our numbers. So I mean, it was good for the library, <laughs> so we were taking them for the team there. Um, Sarah still does cook a book with David, and it's an absolute joy. Um, and those are the videos. We haven't used YouTube um, because our Facebook Live videos get thousands of hits. Um, and and if um, we've seen you know, examples of YouTube, and I don't think we'd get the same amount of traffic on YouTube. So we've really stuck with recording and posting on Facebook or just going live. Live Facebook Live is where we get most of our traffic. Um, I'm also going to make sure I don't go over time because I'm a chatty Kathy sometimes. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, like I said, I'd love to tell you every single detail about every single one of these programs. I would love to hear your questions if, um, if um, you have a question about a certain program and if you're you know, wondering if you could get more information about it, I would love that. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to have them listed so you could look at the slides and um, really have a good idea of what we're doing. So um, for adults, tech help has been a big thing. I mean, we've had a lot of call-ins asking, you know, making sure that they can use, you know, our, our book borrowing system like OverDrive, um, Libby. Um, also, we've done little demos on how to use certain, um, like the catalog, and how to use our Ancestry Library Edition, um, little things like that. We've learned that the shorter videos really do, um, really do well. They're just not as dense. People have time to look at them. They're not overwhelming. Um, and adults love our program kits, and we've, we've started doing. Um, watercolor tutorial kits for them. We've done, um, let's see, there's crafting. And this time of year is really fun. I just made all of our October craft kits. So we've got a lot of uh, fun, like, decoration type, like banners and like, door hangers and stuff for the holidays coming up. So those craft kits get snatched up pretty quickly. Um, Sarah also is, um, has a beading craft. 
um, and boutiquing, and those are part of her culture kits. So um, people are also learning about different cultures around the world while doing crafts that you know these cultures do in their countries, in their you know cities, what wherever she's going that month. Um, but they are very, very uh, popular. All of those are. Now, I know I'm talking about all of the great things that we've done about programming. We have had programs fail. Uh, <laughs> we've had some crash and burns. Um, we've tried to use Zoom for a few things. And uh, we do not, people, I don't know, I think there's too much pressure for Zoom. Like, they, they're not on their own time. They might be expected to participate. And maybe there's only two people there, so there's even more expectation to participate. Um, like I said, we've just had our best our best um, attendance has been Facebook Live and Facebook, and then um, especially also for adults, our um, our marketing coordinator Gina, she posts like book battles on Instagram. Our Instagram stories are very popular as well. Um, so you know she'll do a book battle or vote for this or here's tr we're going to start doing trivia. Um, through Google Forms, so there's just a, there's there's a lot of cool things you can do that are quick and simple, but they keep your audience engaged. So, oh yeah, let's see. Let me, I, I get a little distracted by the, the comment section. I'm gonna, I'm trying to ignore it. I swear. Um, so anyway, and then also quickly, just with teen programming, we all know teen programming is hard. Um, I had I. I think my biggest frustration with us being in a pandemic, which I know nobody can control, but um, is that I had spent like eight years building my teen programming. I had like close to 40, 50 kids at my teen program sometimes. And I was so proud of that for this small town. It took a long time to build that up. And then, you know, COVID hit and uh, everything just kind of got wiped out. So um, the teens, we... Um, we had just a couple, <laughs> just a couple ideas. All I did was um, I did some Zoom chats. So I would be like, hey, every day that we used to meet in person, let's just meet on Zoom, check in. There was no pressure. There was no um, expectations. I, I had a few of them. They would sit there and play video games on their TV. But they had me on Zoom because they just wanted, you know, to be in each other's presence. Um, they did not have to talk if they didn't want to talk. Um, I just we've all got a very we've all got a very good relationship, and um, I wanted them to know that I was still here and I still cared about them. And um, if they did have any issues, they could talk to me about it. Um, and it was I mean it's just a lot of typical teenager stuff, but um, I was I, I felt pretty honored that a lot of them I probably had an average maybe eight teens show up each time, but um, but that was enough. That was enough to tell me that you know. They're still thinking about us. They're still, we're still good. So, and then we had a huge amount of Magic the Gathering cards donated to us um, by a couple collectors, and more than we would ever need for a club or anything. So, um, our let's see, he is our circulation librarian, Cody. He's our um, Magic the Gathering guru. He taught me how to play. Um, but we decided to put together starter packs. And we just wrapped them in brown paper, put a little QR code on the front. Um, and uh, those things go like hotcakes. They can just take them. We have so many magic cards that we're just giving them away. Um, and since we can't hold, um, you know, club meetings anymore, we're just, you know, take it. Do what you, I mean, and a lot of, like, I've probably made close to 40 starter packs, and they just fly off the shelf. So. Anyway, all right, I think I'm going to make sure. Um, oh, yes, one last thing. I'm going to talk about quarantine mail. Um, I missed my children and my teens so much during quarantine that I started sending them little doodles and paper cranes in the mail, and that really caught on. And then I had other, I had parents requesting them. Um, so uh, it was. It started out as just a thing I did to keep my hands busy while I was just kind of sad to not be around my people. Um, but it ended up bringing a lot of joy. So never, um, never underestimate snail mail. 
I know that has nothing to do with virtual programming, but um, but it was it was important. It was important for us to keep connected. I think I have talked about everything I wanted to talk about. I think on my last slide, I've just kind of got some upcoming what's next. Um, I haven't really gotten to when the weather gets bad, <laughs> one month at a time. Um, but we have started doing some started doing some outdoor stuff. Um, we're participating in a scavenger hunt downtown. Um, I have been able to meet with my teens outdoors. Um, I've had probably a total of 13 at the most come, but it's something. Um, yeah, social distanced everything. So anyway, this is just kind of a list of current projects and what's coming up next. But, yeah, that's it for me. So, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. Well, hello. Can everybody hear me? This is Kate from Bremen Public Library. Um, and I want to echo a little bit of what Heidi said, that um, just because something works for her community, just because something works for my community, doesn't mean that it will work for everyone. Um, Bremen is a small town um, south of South Bend. And we are in the heart of the sixth largest Amish community um, in the country. And so as we headed into the pandemic, you know, we, we looked at ourselves and said, well, we know that we're not going to be able to meet everybody. Like, we're not going to be able to, you know, put programs um, out there that will reach everyone because, you know, most of our Amish patrons don't have phones. They don't have the Internet. Um, and so we just said, you know, we're going to do the best that we can to reach those that we can. Um, we're never going to be able to reach everyone. And I think as long as we make an effort and you try, then you are doing a fabulous job. So we um, sat down as a team and kind of went, oh, shoot, like, what do we do now? Because um, these are unprecedented times. We have never had anything like this before. Um, and so we sat down and um, for our summer reading, we decided to do some weekly virtual programs and we thought, you know, the repetition is the key. We want our patrons to know that they can, you know, check Facebook on Mondays at 930 and get our Lego challenge. We want them to know that just like they could come to our building and, you know, experience story time on Wednesdays at 930, we can do that. Um, you know, on YouTube, they, they know that it's the same time every week. So we had something for every day of the week. Um, and then we also had blog posts that went up um, every Monday and Friday. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think it's terribly popular to do blogs, but both our YA person um, and myself as the children's librarian, we both um, just run a blog that we just, you know, add, share the links and just articles, um, literacy skills, all sorts of stuff like that. Something that was a hit for us was a Monday Lego challenge, and it did not take a lot of time for us. We literally, every Monday at 9.30, would just post what that week's challenge was. And it would be, you know, a castle, a roller coaster, a theme park. Um, and kids would have a couple days to build with the Legos they have on their own in their own home. And then they could send us a picture. We would post them on social media. We would vote. And then the winner would get a $10 Subway gift card. Another thing, oh, one of my pictures disappeared. Um, another thing that we did was um, our communications coordinator had the forethought, like, the day that we were closing to go, do you think maybe we should order some T-shirts? And we were like, yes, yes, please. So you'll notice that in every single, anything we put out, YouTube video, um, any sort of program that we did, the staff had our Bremen Public Library T-shirts on just so that it was, some sort of consistency, and everyone would just know that, oh, this is the library doing this program. And another thing we did was we realized that we need to play to our staff's strengths. Um, if somebody, you know, in your library system hates doing STEAM, like, don't make them do STEAM. You know, if there's somebody who excels at something, that's what we want to bring out because they will have um, the energy and the vibrancy to make it a good program. Whereas if you try to shoehorn somebody into a specific role, it doesn't always work out. And so we said, okay, you know, Violet, Violet loves steam. She's going to do steam. Okay, Alex likes cooking, so we'll do cooking. And Cindy's going to do crafts. And I was like, how do we kind of blend those all together into one program? 
and we created our How To Tuesday. So every Tuesday at 2 o'clock, one of our staff members would teach you, you know, something, whether it's making lemon volcanoes or how to make a frog puppet or how to make um, a cooking thing. And I know um, Sarah Morbitzer was doing a phenomenal job with the cook a book. Um, and I know one thing that my staff member Alex did, because she is a very, like, health conscious person, and so she was very conscientious about saying, like, if you can't have dairy, you can substitute this. If you're allergic to this, you can substitute that. Because, of course, in this day and age, there's a lot of allergies, a lot of things that people can't eat. And so we were trying to be conscious of that. For our story time, um, luckily, we were able to be back in the building over the summer. Um, when we first shut down in March, it was just kind of like, here's my living room. Welcome to story time. And it was a little bit awkward, um, but we have luckily an art student who's on our staff, and she drew this fabulous chalk castle on my chalk wall. And so we did story time. Like, it was just like your kids would see you in the same spot in a room during story time. We would be, you know, same backdrop every time we would have the castle and we would do story time. And then, oh, more of my pictures are missing. Sorry about that. Um, we, for Imagine Your Story, we did um, a couple different, you know, things. Like you can see I filmed outside from the picture that's on the screen. Um, another time we did, like, building, like, fairy or gnome houses. And, again, if you have children, if you have pets, get them involved because we um, made like gnome or fairy houses, and then I said, okay, girls, like, I'm going to film you doing some fairy yoga poses because, you know, it's just something to um, let people know that, you know, there's other people involved. Like, even, I don't want people to just see me or just see one staff member. You know, we want them to know that we're all in this together, and no matter how much it just kind of stinks, it is what it is, and we have to make the best of the situation. Um, in the summer, we were able to do some adult programs in person with social distancing because we have a really large um, meeting room. And for any of you who do not know about the Purdue Extension Office, I'm going to tell you right now, make a note to call your local Purdue Extension Office because they will come to your library and do programs for free. Um, so for adults this summer, we had Houseplants 101 and Air Fryer Cooking 101. They will come, um, you know, they'll put on the whole program. All you have to do is set up the room. They also have, um, we've done like healthy eating ones that they'll do for children. There's a social media one that they'll do for teens. So if you have not hooked up with your local Purdue Extension office, I'm telling you right now, make a note to go do it. Um, we also did a painting class. We had a literary art contest. Um, people are in their homes. They're trying to create something. So we said, hey, you know, we're going to have a contest. Make something literary themed, some sort of artwork. It, you know, can be whatever. We had people making stuff out of book pages or doing collages. Um, and then and we still have some people who are turning some in. And then we will, um, you know, hang them in our library for everybody to see. Um, we had our adult book clubs moved to a virtual format, um, and it's, you know, one of those, like, hit or miss. Some people came, some people didn't. It just kind of depended on, um, on the day. And so something that we do with all of our book clubs to kind of help get the word out is after they meet, then we post the book that they read and then their ratings because each person can rate the book on a scale of one to five, and then we um, take the average. And so say, you know, like the Night Owls Book Club met, and they read this book, and they rated it, you know, whatever we rated it, um, just to kind of try to get some more interaction. And then here's just a couple of the flyers from some of the programs that we did over the summer. So when we do something with the book club, like we'll try to take like a nice like stylized photo so it's not just like, a picture of a person holding a book because eventually people will get tired of that. So a couple things that worked. Definitely just kind of branding. Um, everyone wore the BPL shirt t-shirt. Um, and so that was just kind of like the signifier. It helped um, lend a cohesiveness, especially because um, the backdrop was not always the same. Sometimes we were outside, you'd be in this person's home, then you'd be in that person's home. And so having um, the t-shirt was just something that worked well for us. And granted, we do have a smaller staff, so it was something that was financially feasible, um, but that worked very, very well for us. We also had the same intro slides and music, um, and so we just, every time, um, you know, we would have the slide that would say the specific program just for a consistency because it wasn't always the same person who was leading it. 
We found at the beginning um, it was kind of hard to hear, and so we are lucky that we received a grant and we have a media lab, and so we already had a lavalier mic that we could just plug into the iPad, plug into your phone, plug into a camera, and we found that that really helped with sound quality because if people can't hear you or it's fuzziness, they're just going to click off and click onto something else. Another thing that I want to mention is creating Facebook events. Um, if your library is on Facebook and you're trying to engage with people, Facebook events is a wonderful way to get the word out about your programs. If somebody comes to a library and they see a program flyer, you know, they put it in their calendar and they say, oh, cool. But if you post a Facebook event and then they like it or they say that they're interested, then it's more likely to show up in somebody else's feed with all those, you know, mystical Facebook algorithms um, but people can share it. Um, it'll show, you know, this many people are interested, and then it just kind of, you know, spreads from there. So create Facebook events, um, and it will help. Um, hopefully, it has helped us. And then another thing we did was um, on social media, we would post with permission, like when kids did something. So if we had a craft that we would send home, and then the parent would send us a picture, we'd say, hey, can we put, a, you know, put that up on social media? And so we'd say, hey, you know, Peter you know, did Miss Cindy's frog craft or, you know, um, somebody else made, you know, Alex's cookie cake. Um, and we have like a thousand books program. And so even when we, you know, when somebody finishes that, we post it because you'd be surprised the people who don't maybe know about some of the ongoing programs. And even though, you know, it's the rule that like you put it on Facebook, you put it in the email, you post it on flyers and people go, I didn't know. I, I didn't know that you had that. So anything you can do to get the word out. Another thing that worked well was playing to our staff's strengths. Um, you know, you are good at this. We're going to highlight that. You know, Heidi is a fabulous painter. If I tried to lead a painting class, it would be a disaster. Um, so look at your, your staff. Look at what they're good at and what they can reasonably do, you know, at home or in your library. And then um, we did struggle. And some things we had a couple zoom book clubs with literally no children so it was like okay zoom book club is not for us we had a lot of lighting issues um, because our library all of our lights are motion sensor and so like if somebody's in that part of the library the lights will go on but you can't turn them off and so we just had this like harsh overhead lighting and there would be glares, um, and we would sometimes have to move um, things a lot of times before we could get something where it was acceptable. Um, another kind of drawback was the amount of time that it took to edit the videos, because we are blessed that we have a communications coordinator who is like a whiz in iMovie, but we found that it was like we needed the raw footage of a program like a week and a half to two weeks ahead of time just to have enough time to like edit it and make sure that they were all good. Um, there's nothing worse than saying like, oh, we're going to premiere this program at 2 o'clock on this day and at 1.30 somebody is still working frantically trying to do that program. And we did notice that we had a lot of like declining viewership over time. Like we just hit this wall in summer like the beginning of July, where I think it was just everyone was burnt out. Nobody wanted to look at a screen anymore. We just wanted to be able to see people. We wanted to, you know, hug our friends, talk to people. Um, and so the viewership did decline a little bit. And I think that um, it's just something that to be aware of. It's okay to play. It's okay to experiment. You know, let's try a short clip and see if that works. Let's try a long clip. You're not going to know what works until you try. And then now what? What are we doing next? Um, we are lucky in that our kids are back to in-person school five days a week, um, of course, with, you know, some restrictions and quarantining if you test positive and all that. Um, and so because the schools are successfully have been in session for, you know, almost a month, um, we're easing back to in-person programming. We're doing a limited number of participants just to control um, the size. We are making sure that we keep attendance for who is at, like, by name each specific program just for contact tracing purposes. And then something that's been a little draining is, like, we're offering more sessions so that everybody can attend. Um, so where we used to have two story times a week, now we're having three story times a week. Um, and we're also we're learning new skills. So something 
that I just think is so important is that you have to remember that that staff member who's really good at, you know, fill in the blank, editing a video, you know, learning how to use Discord, whatever it may be, they had to learn it sometime. Um, nobody just had innate knowledge that they just knew. Everybody had to learn. And it's okay to take time to learn new skills because this is a pandemic. It is craziness in life right now. And it's okay to, you know, if you need to say, we need to take a couple days off of putting out virtual programming so that we can figure out a better way to, you know, edit our videos or to record them or, you know, whatever it may be. It's okay to take time to work on those skills. And remember that it's not a comparison game. Just because this is what Brayman does doesn't mean that that's what you have to do. Um, you're not, you don't have to put yourself um, up against anybody else. It's not a competition between libraries. You can just do what you can do to do the best program that you can for your community. And then the last thing we're doing is we're staying flexible because this has been one heck of a year and nobody really knows, you know, exactly where we're headed. So just stay flexible, do your best, and your patrons will appreciate it. So if you have any questions or anything, there's my email. Feel free to give me an email and I will get back to you as soon as you can. So thank you. All right, thank you. That was wonderful. Great ideas for Mamie, Heidi, and Kate. I do have one question that came through in the chat earlier, and while I ask that, if you do have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat, and we'll ask the ladies your questions here. Um, the first question was for Amy, and April wanted to know, have you tried cosplay for young adults, and by that she means the age range of 20 to 30? We have done um, all kinds of live events previously. So we've been doing stuff like that all along. Um, we've done everyday cosplay, sort of based on Disney bounding, um, where it's more subtle. It's not like a full cosplay. It's more you're representing your fandom in your regular dress. Uh, we also always do free comic book day as a small library con and we get all kinds of different age levels for that. And we work with um, local cosplay groups that come in and they've even done some sewing and things for us. But virtually, um, you know, we don't know how old you are when you're watching our videos, of course, but um, that particular one, we tried to keep it more for our teens. But yeah, we have done them for all ages. Um, and of course we do you know, Disney events for the Lilies um, where they can dress up and they also make different things. So, you know, being a nerd has been a huge part of our library <laughs> for all ages, adults to preschoolers. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. Okay, it looks like the chat is full of um, great info and thank yous. Um, as a reminder, if you are watching an archived recording of this presentation, information on how to obtain your LEU is in the video's description in YouTube. And we're now going to stop recording.